Hello to all and welcome back to Should You Get. I'm Brother Templar and for today's video I'm going to be talking about the Sunderland 3A. Now, the Sunderland is one of those aircraft that I quite like. And despite the fact you'll hear people saying, oh, your Kai 100, your Peshka 8, and aircraft like that are really overpowered. You never hear much about the Sunderland Mark III, which is, in my opinion, at this current point in time in the game, the most overpowered bomber in the game, if not one of the most overpowered aircraft in the game. Sitting at only a battle rating of 1.7, everything about this aircraft absolutely dominates when it's in the sky, and it does still amaze me to this day how absolutely overpowered this aircraft is, and yet how few people actually fly it. But enough about that for now, and let's get on to the history of this aircraft and see what made it what it was. The Sunderland was mainly based off the S-23 Empire flying boat, a civilian cargo and passenger plane that was designed to be able to reach the far reaches of the, the British United Kingdom and all of its many assets and colonies. However, during the S-23 Empire's development, the British Air Ministry was looking into a military version. In 1933, there was a new specification given out for the next generation of flying boats for ocean reconnaissance. These specifications were fairly lenient, only requiring the new aircraft have four engines and to be either mono or biplane. In response to this, the Short Brothers started on a design that would meet the specification, but at a lower priority to the S-23 Empire. The design was originally going to have the Coventry Ordnance Works 37mm automatic cannon, this was originally going to be mounted in the bow of the aircraft, with a singular Lewis gun in the tail. This new variant was known as the S-25, and the design was submitted to the Air Ministry in 1934. However, the S-25 prototype only first took flight in October 1937. As construction proceeded, the armament was changed to a single 303 Vickers K machine gun in the nose and four 303 Browning machine guns in the tail. There was then a change in the tail turret to a powered version, this being one of the first powered turrets in the world. Now, despite this aircraft being a bird of war, it's actually quite homely, as, just like the S-23, it had two decks with six bunks on the lower deck, a galley with a twin pressure stove, a porcelain flush toilet, an anchoring winch, and even a small machine shop for in-flight repairs. Now, the aircraft was originally fitted with six drum fuel tanks with a total capacity of 9,200 litres, which is around 2,430 US gallons. However, as time went on, it was also equipped with four smaller fuel tanks that were added behind the rear wing spar to give a total fuel capacity of 11,602 litres, which once again is around 3,037 US gallons for you Americans out there. This offered a massive 12-hour patrol time in the aircraft, which for its time was very impressive. Now, the original specification, as I've already mentioned, was a 37mm gun and up to 2,000 pounds of bombs, mines or depth charges. The ordnance was to be stored inside the fuselage in a bomb room and was winched up to ranks under the wing centre section that could be traversed out through doors on each side of the fuselage above the waterline to release position. 
and in fact you can see this on War Thunder if you fly out of the short Sterling and you look under the wings when you drop your bombs you can actually see the mechanism working exactly like it was intended in real life which I have to give it to Ganjin is quite impressive in the end, the overall armament of the aircraft was four 303 British Browning machine guns in the tail, manually operated 303s on either side of the fuselage, firing from ports below and behind the wings, however these were later changed to 50 caliber Brownings. There were also two different nose turret weapons. Uh, the two Browning machine guns that were later changed to four fixed Browning machine guns for the pilot, that being two on each side, and also a twin gun turret on the upper fuselage working as a dorsal turret and one in the nose, bringing the total defensive armament up to 16 machine guns. In the Second World War, the Sunderlands quickly proved their usefulness in the rescue of crews from torpedoed ships. On the 21st of September 1939, two Sunderlands rescued the entire 34-man crew of a torpedoed Merchant uh, ship from the North Sea. However, as British anti-submarine measures improved, the Sunderland began to inflict losses to the German U-boats as well. The Sunderland made its first unassisted kill of a U-boat on the 17th of July 1940. The Sunderland was also found to have very effective defensive armament. In fact, on the 3rd of April 1940, a Sunderland operating off Norway was attacked by six German Junkers Ju-88 fighters. It shot down one, damaged another enough to send it off and force it to do a crash landing and drove off the rest. The Germans nicknamed it after this the Fliegenhez Stauerstein, or Flying Porcupine, due to its defensive firepower. Not only this, but the Sunderlands also proved themselves in the Mediterranean theatre. They flew many evacuation missions during the German seizure of Crete, carrying a surprisingly high number of passengers. Also, one flew the reconnaissance mission to observe the Italian's fleet at anchor in Toronto before the famous Royal Navy Fleet Air Arms torpedo attack on the 11th of November 1940. Now, the introduction of the Sunderland into the RAF was in 1938, and it retired in 1959. But that's only with the Royal Air Force, as the Royal New Zealand Air Force, it was retired in 1967. Now, it was produced between 1938 and 1946, with 777 numbers built. And there you have it, the Short Sunderland. One of those aircraft that, honestly, when I first looked it up, I thought it was going to be a massive failure that only saw one year of the war and was widely regarded as useless and, well, all this kind of stuff. As I'm so used to its battle rating in War Thunder, but as you can see, this aircraft was very good in the Second World War. It was everything the RAF needed into, through, and even post Second World War. I mean, one thing I didn't mention is that the Sunderland even saw active service in the Korean War. And yet, this aircraft is thought to be fighting uh, basically early war designs at a 1.7 battle rating in War Thunder. One of those things I just can't get my head around. So, looking up the short Sterling's history, it is perhaps no surprise that this aircraft absolutely dominates in War Thunder. It is everything you want at a low battle rating, 
amazingly good armament, great bomb loads, um, decent speed, decent maneuverability, and, well, it lands on water, which is kinda cool, really. And yet, despite all this, would you believe me if I said it was actually underperforming? Yes, this aircraft is actually not doing as well as it should be, and, well, let's quickly head over to the hangar to see exactly why. So, welcome to the hangar, and I just came here to show you the uh, great armour of the aircraft. Uh, yeah, mm, it's good. But no, on a serious note, I came to show you these two figures here. Now, they both count as gunners, but they don't appear to be doing anything in there. So, what are they doing? And, well, when two people, well, two men, are locked inside a dark room to themselves, anything can happen. But, if you were listening to what I was just talking about, when I was talking about the history of this aircraft, then you'll know what they're doing. Because, you see, this aircraft has 16 guns altogether. And yet, you can only see 12 on the current model in-game. Two on the front gunner, four for the pilot, two on the dorsal turret, and four for the rear gunner. So, the other four guns, where are they? And simply put, they're here. This is where they are. I believe these windows are the ones are what do they fire out of. I'm not entirely sure. It's very difficult to find some solid information on this aircraft, but I believe these windows here are for the gunners to shoot out of. So, technically, there should be uh, four more guns in this game in its current state, but unfortunately there isn't. So that's a shame, and hopefully they will get added soon. So, when you look at this aircraft at a 1.7 battle rating, I think that's a little bit too, well, modest for the aircraft in reality, as uh, you've probably figured out already. But what exactly makes it so overpowered? And it comes down to many different features, but in order for me to be able to, well, show you how exactly overpowered this aircraft is, we're going to have to look at three specific aircraft. The Short Stirling, the Bristol Blenheim, and the uh, Balfort. Now, the Stirling sits at a 5.0 battle rating, as I'm sure you're aware, and if you watched my Stirling review video, then you know that the uh, Short Stirling was actually based off the Sunderland in design, so they do have quite a bit of similarities to them. As for the Blenheim and the Balfort, both of those aircraft, although share no real similarities, they are both at a higher battle rating than the Short Sterling. So you'd imagine the Sterling is inferior to them, right? And indeed, you would be correct in thinking that if you were talking about speed, as, as you can see, the Sunderland is the slowest. However, if you are referring to, well, about anything else, you would be sorely mistaken, as the Sunderland absolutely dominates on defensive armament. As I've already said, the Sunderland isn't actually at its strongest. It should have around four more guns that should be 50 caliber sticking out the sides of the aircraft that haven't been added yet. So, once again, this aircraft isn't even at its full strength, and it already is vastly better armed than the other two bombers. Furthermore, this aircraft actually has double the bomb load of the Balfort and the Blenheim, meaning that it is, well, superior in just about every important role a bomber must partake in. Yes, it's not very fast, but when you've got defensive armament like this, and you can tank hits like this, it doesn't matter. You see, due to the large size of the Sunderland, it can soak hits very well, and means that it does take a lot of shots to hit anything vital. And, thanks to its four engines, it actually means that it can be hit and lose one engine, and still be able to fly. 
Uh, losing two engines, however, would force it into a gradual descent. But just about 30 seconds ago, you saw an MC-202 firing a ridiculous amount of rounds into me, and you can see the damage on my fuselage. It's minimal at best. It has made almost no effect whatsoever to flight performance, and it, it wasn't even a challenge. I can't even say it offered even the slightest challenge. And that's not because I'm an amazing pilot, and that's not because the MZ-202 is a bad plane, that's just because the Sunderland is a 1.7 battle rating aircraft. It is so superior against anything that has 50 caliber or 7.7 weapons, because it just soaks them up. It doesn't care. Yes, 20mm weapons can cause this aircraft a bit of trouble, but they are quite rare at this battle rating, and even then, as long as you can kill the enemy aircraft fairly quickly, you can still make out of it without too much damage. But don't think I've forgotten about that short Sterling. Yes, this aircraft does look quite similar to it, as well as it being very similar in its design. Now, between these two aircraft, there are, of course, a few differences. One being, of course, that the Sterling has a vastly superior bomb load. But that's really all of the advantages. I mean, yes, the Sterling is... Uh, well, it does have wheels so it can land on the ground easier, but... I don't know, that's not really an advantage. I mean, you could argue that the short Sterling's advantage is that it can land on water. Uh, so... That's not really an advantage or disadvantage. And they have the same defensive armament. One dorsal turret, one front turret, and one rear turret. Same guns, same armament, same everything. The only difference being, the Sunderland has four offensive guns in the front, and should have four under the wings. Meaning that the Sunderland is better armed than the Sterling. Not only this, but it's also faster than the Sterling. I mean, that's that's ridiculous. How an aircraft that is a 5.0 battle rating is not only worse armed than an aircraft that is at 1.7, but also is slower than an aircraft that's at 1.7 and can't land on water, so it loses many points for that because landing on the water is really cool. So, of course, the question is, should this aircraft be at a 1.7? And, well, no, obviously. It really shouldn't. And in fact, just to prove how overpowered this aircraft is, I'm going to tell you a little story. You see, on this game, my best ever game ever on a realistic match was when I went 7 and 0, oh, as well as getting a lot of ground targets as well. Now, when I was flying this aircraft, I wasn't in some kind of overpowered monstrosity like a jet versus biplanes or anything, or some ridiculously unfair thing like that. No, I was flying the short Sunderland. Now, allow me to say what happened. I was playing against, well, Japan. They were at well, I was down tiered, so I was fighting aircraft as low as stock, 1.0 battle rating, Japanese biplanes and things of the sort. I flew in and tried to bomb out some bases and what have you, but the biplanes all went for me first. In fact, seven of them all went for me. And, well, as you could probably have guessed by now, I shot down every single one. I simply turned around and allowed my tail gunners to just rip them all to, uh, well, to shreds and they couldn't do anything about it. Their 7-7s were just plinking off my armor, I ripped them apart, it was a massacre. Now annoyingly I don't actually have the footage for it, I did record it and I emailed it to one of those top 5 video clip things um, and annoyingly, I don't have it anymore. I've actually, literally just today, I went back and looked at my outbox on my email. I looked as far back as possible, and I can't find it. So you are going to have to believe me, but just think about it. 1.0 Japanese biplanes versus the Sunderland. Is it that hard to believe? I don't think it is. Anyway, 
So, this aircraft should probably stand, in my opinion, at at least 2.5 battle rating, if not a 3.0 battle rating or something like that. It is too good at its current battle rating, far too good, and, well, to think it has the same armament as a Sterling, well, better armament, actually, and yet it's so much lower battle rating, it's an insult, to be perfectly honest with you. And yes, the Sterling should be at maybe like a 3.5, 3.7, but even so, this aircraft is just so much better. Anyway, so, in conclusion to this video, should you get the Sunderland 3A? Well, if you enjoy seal clubbing, then this is the ideal aircraft for you. It bombs well, it attacks well, it is a gunship, and it is unstoppable. So, I can only recommend the Sunderland if you like absolutely decimating everything you come up against. So, that's all from me for today. I hope you liked what you saw. If you did, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. It's always appreciated. And until next time, I say thank you very much, and I'll see you then.